Well, hey guys, it is uh, Sunday night, and we're getting ready to talk about chapters 13 and 14. So, uh, uh, again, I want to go over a few things before we get into the chapters. First off, it looks like the tests are coming back pretty good. So, uh, you guys still have, I think, about three hours left to take that. But right now, the scores I'm seeing are improvements over the first exam. So, congratulations. I'd love to see that. It means you guys are growing. Secondly, I do want to hit that one discussion question. I know um, it caught a lot of you off guard, and I, I, I want to reiterate something we've talked about in the past, and that is if you don't understand the question or you're not sure where it's coming from, please call me, text me, email me. Only one person in this class reached out to me to clarify what that question meant, and she was the only one who had the question right that the, the three chapters we were discussing about all talked about prospecting clients, selling. Who do we sell to in the corporate market? Who do we sell to in the Smurf market? A lot of you got confused on the idea that we were looking for jobs. This class has nothing to do with that. So again, guys, I know you might see a classmate answer the question that way. If you don't believe they have it right, please, by all means, don't assume they understand it. Reach out to me. Call me. Now, I did kind of try to help everybody out as best I could. I gave you guys half credit for just answering the question. Um, but again, if you don't understand it, by all means, email me. Okay, guys? All right. So here we go. Chapter 13, function rooms and meeting space. So some things we need to know from this chapter. First off, the types of function space we're going to talk about. Meeting rooms. Pretty common. Rooms that we're going to have meetings in. Rooms that we're going to have social functions in. They're the basic meeting rooms that you see in a hotel. Secondly, common space. Common space can be used for a lot of things. We can do registration out there. Uh, we can do meals out there, actually. We can set up exhibits. Uh, hotels can get very, very creative with their common space, if you will. And the common space usually is areas where people just kind of meet and gather, if you will. My hotel is called the atrium area or pool area is a common space. The lobby area would be a common space. So, again, keep those in mind. Foyers, the area out in front of meeting rooms. Again, someplace we can set up different things from break services to exhibits um, to registration areas. Um, exhibit halls. Again, my hotel actually has two long exhibit halls that we'll set exhibits in as well as some of our ballrooms. So again, those are additional spaces that we can use, sell to clients, generate revenue. Uh, and lastly, you know, I'm going to throw out there overnight rooms. There have been times that we've converted overnight rooms into small one-on-one -on -one meeting rooms. And it does happen. It's not common because most hotels have enough small meeting space that they can actually do that in. Um, when we've had uh, really huge requests, 20, 30, 40 small meeting rooms, we will sometimes convert uh, overnight rooms into meeting space. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about function space. What do we need to know about our function space? Well, we need to know a lot of stuff, okay? The capacity of the room, uh, with setup and size. So you got to know what your your um, your specs are. You know, it's a 20 by 40 room, 11 foot ceilings. It's got 1,400 square feet of space. It's got two pillars here and natural light there. We're going to go into that here in a little bit as well. Um, you know, um, what's the capacity depending on how your setup is? Yes, this room will hold 300 in rounds of 10, but classroom style, it only holds, say, 150, two per six. We can bump it up to almost 225, if we go three per six. In a standing reception, we can do 400. In theater style, we can do 450. So again, knowing what your room capacities are based on what the room setup is. These are things you're gonna to need to know as a sales manager, okay? We talked about some of the room attributes. Does it have pillars? Does it have natural light? Is there something strange about the room? It, it, it loses spot because it bends in a certain place. It has a corner that, you know, could be could be used if the room is set up one way, but not used if the room is set up a different way. Um, like for our instance, we have the Grand Hall. It has 60-foot barrel ceilings and lots of natural light that we can't control. That's an attribute we need to make sure that our clients are under, you know, understand. Um, what are the AV setups? Is it already in the room? There are a number of hotels who have built-in AV. There's no additional charge. My hotel only has two rooms of our 33 that do that. So I need to make sure my clients understand that, hey, these rooms do not come with AV. And if you want screen, projector, what have you, that's an additional cost. Okay? Tear down setup time. Are we trying to flip a room? You know, we're going to do a reception here. We're going to turn that room over. And by tomorrow morning, we're going to have it at our general session room. Or it's going to start out at our general session room. We're going to turn it over. It's going to be a reception area later on in the evening. What's our tear down time? Is there an additional cost for that? How much time do we have to have? From the end of the meeting to the beginning of the reception to make sure we can do that uh, to make that change 
Traffic flow, this is huge. A lot of planners are gonna to wanna to make it as simple as possible, and this makes complete sense, for the flow of their attendees to get from one room to the next. And it might be that our general session room is here, and we have four breakout rooms, and their meal rooms are here. What is the flow? Are they going up and down stairs? Do they have to go across the hotel? Is it an easy walk where it's one or two turns? Is it walking them through the hotel? We've got to have signage up. All this is really, really huge concerns to the planner and are things you're going to want to address because the competition is definitely going to address that. You know, if I'm going against a hotel that has their meeting space on four different floors, I might point out to the planner, you know, the really nice thing about our space is you go to one, you know, go down one set of uh, stairs and boom, there's your six uh, breakout rooms, your meal room, your exhibit hall are all right there as opposed to my competition where the third floor has your general session, the fourth floor has your breakouts, the fifth floor has your, you know, you're all over the place. So again, keep those in mind. Those are going to come up as you're selling your property. Okay. Now from an internal side, who sells and who's allowed to sell space? Now, this really varies upon the different hotels. And for instance, my hotel, I can sell space because I have overnight rooms um, typically with them. I can go a year out, two years out, 10 years out. I have no handcuffs, if you will, when it comes to selling our space. Our catering staff, however, does. It has to book inside of a certain window, and that window typically is between six months and a year. They can't book out any further than that because again, when they book a space, their bookings typically have very little overnight rooms. And we've already talked about most hotels, that's their bread and butter. 80% revenue made off of heads and beds. So if I let the catering staff take up a good majority of our space, that doesn't allow my sales department, if you will, to sell rooms that would be tied then to a meeting because we have no meeting space left. So again, that's an internal kind of issue that's gonna be handled by the director of sales, might be the general manager, but that's gonna be laid out in advance and it's, it's laid out accordingly so that the hotel can make the most revenue as possible. So keep that in mind. Um, we'll also talk about, uh, actually right now, I'm gonna go ahead and address what the room charges are. So in my world, because I'm bringing in overnight rooms, and that is, again, the main point of where we get a lot of our revenue from, I get to toy a lot, or I get to, to um, tweak, if you will, our room rental. Now, the Illinois Street Ballroom, which is one of our nicest ballrooms, the rack rate, in other words, if you just came in and had nothing else going on, but you just needed that room, it's $1,500 to use it. But in my world, if I've got 100 rooms on peak for three straight nights, I can waive the room rental because the revenue we're bringing in on the, on the overnight rooms is higher. I guess not higher, but, but it's, it's going to cause enough of a, of, a, of a win for the hotel that if I have to, to um, go back and forth in my planner, I'll waive the room rental to get the 300 overnight rooms, which again, making 80% revenue off of, to make sure we get that money in. The catering world is a little different. They don't have overnight rooms typically involved. So now you're looking at where am I getting my revenue from? Well, we're getting it from food and beverage. And again, as we're going to talk uh, here in a little bit, actually in the next chapter, Revenue off of food and beverage is about 35 to 40%. There's a 60% cost for our food and beverage. So, so the revenue generated is not as high. So in their world, because room revenue typically is, is 100% revenue, because again, the, the, the mortgage or the rent that you're paying for a hotel is, is not usually uh, counted into how we figure out pricing for our meeting room. So we look at room revenue, typically it's 100% revenue. So typically, you know, we want to get that if we can, but again, I'm not going to sacrifice overnight rooms where, the, where the, the markup is good and the quantity is higher, but in a catering function, we need that room revenue because it helps, bring, it helps make that a bigger revenue piece, if you will. So a lot of times, they're not going to tweak that room revenue. They're going to try to get as much of it as they can. So keep that in mind, depending on what kind of sales manager you are, if you're catering sales, if you're rooms sales manager, again, it's going to be a few different rules that you have to abide by, if you will. So, talking about, too, in this chapter, room diagrams and equipment. Now, um, this is very important, and, and what we're going to talk about a number of different things here. Um, the diagrams that you can use, and there are a number of distance, different systems out there. Delphi diagrams can actually help you diagram a room and send it to the planner. We use what's called social tables, and it's actually an on, it's a internet app, and it's fantastic. But what these diagrams do, and the whole purpose behind them is, is for you to draw a picture, if you will, for your planner 
to show them what the room is going to look like when they're booking or, or for their booking, if you will. So I get to go on social tables. I can drop down the type of tables I'm using. I can drop down the setup I'm using. We're going to go into that here in just a minute. But, you know, if the room is theater style or if it is classroom style, I can show that. I can show where their lectern is. I can show where their staging is. If they're going to have a break inside the room, I can show that. The, the, the software that we have is so advanced now, besides just showing you a 2D diagram, I can show it in 3D. You know, you can turn the room, you can twist it around, you can see it from above, you can see it from the side, you can see it from how the speaker sees it, you can see it from how the attendee sees it. These are all such wonderful tools because, again, it allows the client to visually see how this room is going to look when they're there for their meeting. It allows them to be more confident in the setup. It allows them to ask more questions about the setup. It lets them see where they have space, where they don't have space. Hey, can I drop this in here? Maybe we do need two screens because I'm looking from this angle and I can't see the screen. You know, it's just, it's a much better piece to get a fully viewed picture of what their event's going to look like. So obviously it's beneficial to me and it's usually beneficial to the planner. Um, you know, we're going to get into some of the nuts and bolts when we talk about room diagrams and equipment. But you need to be clear on the size of things. And, and this sounds so basic, but it can be so confusing. We've thrown out the term early on about mystical, um, mutual mystification, if you will. In other words, we think we're talking about the same thing, but we're not. Because I can tell you, hey, we're talking about classroom style two per six. Well, that person might think we're talking about long tables that are actually 36 inches in width. And I'm talking about 18 inch in width. And that changes the diagram of the room, if you will. You know, we talk about uh, our rounds. Well, there are 60-inch rounds and there are 55-inch rounds. And one can hold 10 and one can hold 12. So, again, as we talk about this, staging is a great example. I can have a 4x6 stage. I can have a 8 by 24 stage. Again, we want to be clear. And so there is so much equipment out there. And there are so many varieties of how we set things up. You have to have those very, very clear conversations with your planner to make sure everybody's on the same page, if you will. Okay, so we're talking about basic room setups. And for those of you who are, are somewhat new to this industry, I want to go over these real quickly. Uh, the book does a great job of defining them and, and laying them out for you. But these are what you're going to see on a regular basis. And, and this is ever-changing. There are always new diagrams coming out. There are always new creative ways planners want to set a room. But these are some of your basic. One is theater style, basically chairs. Okay, so you think of a theater as just chairs set up. There's no tables. Speakers are usually up in the front. You've got classroom style. What classroom is, is typically about a six foot table by 18 inches, and usually you can fit between two and three people at this table. We call that classroom style because a lot of times our training sessions are set up that way. So table, two sets of chairs, behind them table, two sets of chairs. And, and they will vary that sometimes. There's one called herringbone where now they're at an angle as opposed to being straight on. So there can be a little bit of variation, but classroom style typically means you've got a table in front of you and a chair to sit in. And, that, and that's probably, for any kind of training session, any kind of information session, that's a, a very standard uh, setup because obviously you can take notes, you can have your laptop in front of you, what have you. You've got U-shaped, just what it sounds like. The tables all make a U. Okay, and they usually the speakers in the very, very front of the U. These are great because you can converse with each other and everybody's looking at one another. You also have what's called hollow square. You just put another end on, you basically put two more tables on the end. It hollows it out, it makes a square. Again, great for conversations, uh, great for brainstorming, if you will. Um, horseshoe is kind of the same as U shaped, it makes like a horseshoe. Um, hollow square, you talk about conference style or boardroom uh, style. Typically, our two of your classroom style tables together and they're going to make a long run. So if you think of a boardroom, you have a long boardroom table, we're going to make the same kind of thing but we're going to use our uh, six foot, 18 inch tables, butt them up against each other and again, we've got people on either side, everybody can look at one another and now we're having open conversations. Um, and then um, you're going to have rounds and rounds can go all over the place. You can have uh, 10 person rounds, 12 person rounds. You can also set, and this is becoming very popular, and it's, it's kind of unfortunate for hotels because it's a space eater. We have what we call crescent rounds. Now, there are specific tables that are made for this. And just think of a round table cut in half. It makes a moon shape, a crescent, and you could put people around the crescent. Anywhere between four and as many as seven, but usually in that case, you need a full round table to do that. But what it basically does is it puts people at a round table 
with nobody sitting with their back to the presenters. Everybody sitting on the, the back side of the round, if you will. Um, but yeah, crescent rounds can be anywhere between four, five, six, and as many as seven. They, they eat up a lot of space because obviously a round table takes up a lot of space and you're not using part of it. So it, it, we, I sometimes consider that a space eater. Now again, if you have the crescent rounds, that's great because it cuts off that wasted table and you're in good shape. So that kind of walks you through, um, again, chapter 13, gets you through some of the basics. Um, take a quick drink here as always. And now let's get into chapter 14. Now we're talking about food and beverage services. And man, you talk about a variety of things that can go on when we talk about food and beverage. Again, you guys know there are how many different restaurants in the world, how many different types of restaurants. Same thing can be said about food and beverage functions. They can be as varied as an individual and what their likes and dislikes are. So some of the trends that I've seen in my nine and a half years in the industry, people are going healthier now. You're looking at food that is, you know, lower in calorie count, um, healthier snacks, you know, where it used to be maybe chips and pretzels and, and things that were quote unquote not so good for you. Now it's power bars. Now it's cliff bars. Now it is energy type food, you know, peanuts where you're going to get high protein. Um, again, so we're, we're trying to, you know, adjust to our clientele. There are still some of those who, you know, will take whatever it is we want, you know, they, you know, it doesn't have to be on the healthier side, but we're seeing a lot of groups go towards the healthier side, you know, less soda pop, more water, more tea, more lemonade, those kind of things. So we have to be creative with them. You're also seeing a lot of creative just meals in general, whether it's from carving stations, whether it is family style dining where you're putting, a, you know, a whole plate of chicken breasts and every table is kind of sharing that, a whole table of mashed potatoes and that kind of stuff. So you're seeing a lot of variation amongst planners. And we as hotels, you know, a lot of times you have your menus kind of set. Well, people can order off the menu and, and, and always do, but you also have to have a chef and a staff that can be a little creative and say, hey, we're going to go outside the box. This is how we want it. And they have the chef to set a price for us. So you're seeing a lot more of that. You're definitely seeing more specialized meals. And by specialized meals, I mean gluten-free, vegan, um, you know, if, if um, again, just, you know, if there are allergies that we have to be aware of, we're going to set, you know, set those up. We're blessed in my hotel. Our chef loves to do those kind of things. He, I think he looks at it as a challenge. So as long as the planner is up front with us and we know it in advance, he can create different meals that fall into those categories. So that's some of the trends you're seeing uh, as far as, you know, what we're seeing in the industry. Again, creativity is always going to be there. You, you're going to want to see people do things very different that makes them stand out again remember we talked about this before for a lot of these planners and a lot of these uh, companies it's their chance to shine they want to be they want to step outside the box they want to make sure they're unique they're different and, and that anybody who's attending these meetings appreciates all that so we touched on it uh, in the last chapter as i was talking here food and beverage profits you're looking at between 35 and 40 percent a lot of a lot of your event costs when we do different events and meetings food costs are always your highest uh, it can be anywhere between 55 and 65% when it talks about cost of food for those events. At our hotel, and you're seeing this a lot in Indiana, a lot of people are trying to go local. So again, getting Indi Indiana producers, things that were free range. Um, again, something within the 100, 150 mile radius of our hotel. Um, it's, more co it's more socially responsible. Um, a lot of times it's better food quality. Obviously, there are some lesser costs because they're not transportation to get the food to us as much. So again, a lot of those things hotels are taking a good, strong look at. Um, we talk about types of food functions. And guys, again, you can be as creative as you want on these. But some of the typical ones you're going to see in the meeting world, which I kind of fall into, breakfast, lunch, dinner, a.m. or morning and afternoon breaks. That's your typical what you kind of see from a lot of different meetings. Now, creativity can reign in those because you can have plated, you can have buffets, you can have, you know, um, gosh, you can, again, you can go back to the stations and those kind of things. So there's still a, a way to be creative with those, but that's kind of your standard. And, and again, you're talking about trying to fall within likes and dislikes, um, budgets, uh, and again, the creativity part. So again, we may go from a group that wants you know, a deli style platter with, with buns and the sides and chips and, and drinks 
to the next day it might be you know chicken piccata with you know <laughs> you name it I mean, whatever's on it so again the hotel has to have that there that uh that ability to vary ability to be creative um and again that that's definitely going to set it aside from other hotels talk about breaks we kind of already touched on it you know we look at some people going more healthy um, you still have your sweet breaks, you know, where it's an afternoon break and it's ice cream sandwiches or it's a chocolate fountain and we're going to fondue, basically. So, again, you're going to have both sides of that. But, it, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, what we're seeing is, again, a variety of different types of breaks. And then lastly, especially like with our hotel, we've got some majorly unique space, the Grand Hall or Illinois Street Ballroom. We see a ton of galas, receptions, weddings. Now you're really trying to set yourself aside, and those meals can get absolutely crazy. Again, from those carving stations where we're carving roast beef, we're carving turkey, we could be carving a lamb, uh, filet mignon, you name it. One of the stations could be shrimp shooters. The next station could be a mashed potato martini bar. Um, there's such a variety of what we can do. And hey, the client may come to us and say, hey, we saw this in New York. Can you guys do it here? Well, absolutely if we can. You know, Just let us know how you had it set up, and we'll make, we'll make it happen. Um, so again, types of food functions constantly will change, constantly will vary, but the ones we just talked about are kind of what we see on a regular basis. You'll have some variation thrown in there, but that's kind of your norm. Cost and attendance. All right, so cost can be broken down in so many different ways. You can do it by consumption, and that basically means what are you eating or what are you drinking, and we're going to base it on that, okay? Or it can be a per-person price. And that way we're saying, you know what, for what you want, it's going to be $33 a person. It's going to be $50 a person or $20 a person. And we lay it out that way. As far as your attendance numbers go, most hotels ask you to have those attendance numbers in about 72 hours prior to your event. That makes sure we order enough food, that we have our right numbers, food's not going to waste, we're not coming up short, the worst thing you can do in the hotel world. Um, so again, those kind of things are all dealt with within that last week, if you will, to make sure we have the right numbers. And at that time, we're going to ask for specialty meals as well. Who's vegan? Who's gluten-free? Uh, who's a vegetarian? Any of those kind of things have to be done that time so we can make sure meals are prepped accordingly. Um, let me talk about prices. Much like rooms, there's typically a minimum spend. Yes. Talk about minimum food and beverage amount. So a lot of times what hotels will do, and you'll definitely see this from the catering side, is we'll say, we'll look at the number of people coming, we'll look at our menus, and we're going to come up with a minimum amount of food and beverage that those people have to spend. And it might be tied to what room you're in as well. You're using the Grand Hall at my hotel, which is 14,000 square feet and can hold about 500 people uh, at its max. I'm going to make you spend enough that if you're going to take up that room and prevent me from booking anything you know, in, to the max, you're going to have to help kind of help me out with the food and beverage. So I'll give you a perfect example. For those of you who want to be um, <laughs> wedding planners, weddings in the month of May, June, July, and August uh, fall into the wedding, the wedding calendar, the, the heavy wedding calendar. In our world, if you want to do a wedding at the Crown Plaza in the Grand Hall, you're talking about $2,500 in food and beverage. I'm sorry, $2,500 in room rental and $20,000 in food and beverage, no matter what size your wedding is. So if you want a 100-person wedding in that room or you want a 450-person wedding in that room, that minimum food and beverage is $20,000. A lot of hotels will set their food and beverage on the size of the room, knowing what their max they can gain from that. And if you're going to be, you know, if you love that room that much, then you're going to have to order meals that equal that amount. And that's not very hard. I mean, again, you can be as creative as you want. We can order the super expensive desserts and the entrees and this and that. I mean, we can get you there. That's not a problem. But again, that's something that the planners have to know. Um, the other thing, and I'm trying to think, we're going to talk about this here in just a minute. So hang on a minute. Um, let me go into how we staff these functions. So again, the book does a really good job of, of kind of laying this out for you guys, but you're talking about servers and typically one server for every two tables, which is about 20 to 24 people, depending on how you set the room. You have one banquet captain for about every 10 to 12 tables. So that's your staff. And again, they've got to be quick, courteous, alert to things that are going on, um, and obviously, there are a lot of basics that go into when it comes to food and beverage service. How you serve, you serve the women first at the table, you serve from the right side of the left, you know, you take away from the left side. Um, recognizing when things are short on the table, water needs, what have you. If there's a problem at the table, addressing it right away. There's a lot of things that goes into being a server. And I have to say, the one thing I have grown a great respect for is the service staff that handles the functions at our hotel. Um, what those guys do and, and how they do it is absolutely tremendous. 
and that will set you apart from other hotels. I, I can't say it enough. We talked about service before. It is what brings people back to the hotel. If they have a great experience, they were they were their service you know matched the money that was spent, uh, the quality of the food. They will continue to come back to you time and time again. So that is a huge huge piece of all this. That's kind of the food side. Talk about the beverage side, okay? And again, when we talk about beverages. Uh, we're talking about bars. So again, we're talking about alcoholic beverages. You can set this up in a number of different ways. You've got host bars, meaning that the, the people who are paying for everything are paying for everything. So in other words, let's say Eli Lilly has a reception at the hotel. It's a host bar. The individuals who are attending it aren't paying for a dime. Eli Lilly is. And they can set that up on a per price, per drink. They can set it up per bottle opened. They can set it up as a flat cost. Hey, you're having a two-hour reception. We're going to go premium drinks. We're going to charge you $23 a head. And, and, and again, they can drink as much as they want for that two-hour time period. You're only paying $23 per person that's attending. So those are, or we can have a hybrid too. I'm sorry, I apologize. So you can have a hybrid where we say, okay, the bar is three hours long. For the first hour, it is a host bar. We're paying for all the drinks. Hours two and three are individuals pay their own, and we're going to provide them coupons. So everybody who walked in got two coupons. We're going to pay for the first hour. We're going to pay for any coupon that's redeemed. And that's a per drink price. But that last two hours also will be once they've exhausted the coupon, then they're on their own. So if they want to buy another beer, they want to buy a, 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 a Coke and, and Jack or what have you, there's a per price cost and the individual is paying that. So that's kind of how we lay out our bars. We talk about types of bars. You have you know house brands, premium band, brands, and usually platinum. And what that basically is is the type and quality of alcohol. House brands are going to be usually your least expensive, if you will. Not bad. You know, most of us probably wouldn't, wouldn't have a problem with it. You know, domestic beers, um, your, I don't want to say lower end wine, but again, not something that you're going to see in the very, very high end. When you go to premiums, you're taking a step up. When you go to platinum, think your highest of everything. Highest wine, imported beers, premium liquors. Okay, and, and again, the, the price is going to change accordingly. So that's kind of your house brand setup. We talked a little about the pricing already. Per person cost, meaning me as an individual is paying for every drink I have. The host, where again, it's being charged to the, the entity that's hosting that bar. And it's either a per person, a per person cost or a per drink cost, or it's a hybrid thereof. Okay, um, again, we're talking about staffing. We talked about it from the food and beverage side. Staffing from a uh, the bartending reception side, typically it's one bartender per 75. You can definitely go one per 50 if you wanted to have a little more service oriented, if you will. Those bartenders have a lot of responsibilities. Um, they have to keep their bar stocked. They have to know what the drinks of choice are. If there's a specialty drink involved, um, they have to know when enough is enough. You know, there are times our bartenders have to say, you know what, you're stumbling. Uh, your speech is slurred. We're not going to serve you anymore. And that usually is a banquet captain. They will have to come in and back them up on that. So, um, and then again, that goes a long way. I think we told the steak and steak story, story that cost me a $100,000 piece of business because a bartender got lazy and didn't refill his bar. So again, those guys, all those service line, front line, hands on the clients are so, so important because they are making the impression of what our hotel is. Um, Again, we're going to talk a little bit. The book's going to talk about this in a little bit greater detail. I'm going to touch on this real fast. Your post-event stuff. So again, we talked about being uh, per drink cost or on consumption, if you will. Then the bar has to sit down at the end of the night, tally everything accordingly. We get those numbers uh, to our crown meetings director. They're going to get it to the client. That's a lot of responsibility for those bartenders. Either they're keeping tickets or they're keeping tally marks of how many drinks they've sold. And they got to make sure that that's you know, done accordingly. So number one, we don't overcharge the client. We don't undercharge the client. We make sure we make our revenue. Um, again, the other thing they might do is if it's by a per bottle opened, you know, this keg was tapped, they're paying for the keg. That bottle of Jack Daniels was open, they pay for the entire bottle. So again, all that has to be very good documentation so the client understands what they're spending and they feel comfortable with it. All right, so there is chapter 13 and 14. Guys, you're going to have a second lecture coming out here within the next 24 hours. I am going on, a, I guess, a vacation, if you will. I have a cousin getting married down in Savannah, Georgia, and I'm leaving on Thursday. So, again, if you need to get a hold of me, you guys have my emails, you have my cell phone. I'm going to have all of our projects up and online. Our last test is coming up, I think, next week. That'll be up there probably already. Uh, again, like I said, the test scores for this one look really, really good. A lot of improvement from what I've seen so far, the scores that are coming in. 
I know that discussion kind of got you. Again, if you don't understand it, please, please, guys, reach out to me and ask me, okay? All those discussions are going to correlate with the with the chapters we're going over, all right? So, hey, we are in week six. We're two weeks away from being done. Again, I thank you guys all for your involvement, your dedication to this. Uh, best of luck with the next two weeks. Thanks, guys.